Okay, so we've been joined once again by Dr. E. Michael Jones. We're going to be talking about his book, Degenerate Moderns. I just thought I'd say, um, make a comparison and see what you think about this. It reminded me of the book uh, Heretics by G.K. Chesterton, if you've read that. And I was wondering if you saw this book and others that you've written as a part of like a Catholic tradition of identifying heresy. Is, is that a fair comparison or...? <laughs> No, I, I didn't think of that at all. First of all, uh, let me situate this in my own intellectual development. Uh, I had uh, done a doctoral dissertation on Nathaniel Hawthorne and was trained to be a, a English teacher, literary critic, and got fired uh, from my job because I opposed abortion at a Catholic college. And at that point, I started a magazine that would I conceived of as a Catholic magazine. And so I was dealing with what I thought were Catholic issues. Mm. And then uh, by so by the by the late 80s, I started in 81, by the late 80s, uh, I started to wonder, is there any connection between my career as a literary critic, uh, a former professor, and my career as a Catholic apologist, Catholic activist? And this was uh, the step that I took to join up those two identities that I had, because at that point they, they didn't link up, they didn't line up. So I would write, uh, write polemical pieces about the, the parlous state of the Catholic church in America. Uh, uh, but none of, none of the philosophical literary training was entering into this. And at this point, I also went experienced a kind of burnout because I'd spent a lot of time doing research into Medjugorje, uh, the phony apparition in, in uh, Yugoslavia. And I thought, in my humble opinion, I thought it was a masterpiece of investigative journalism, but everybody uh, on my subscriber list hated it and hated me for doing it. I had one guy write to me and said, he's pr praying to the blessed mother that I have a massive heart attack. <laughs> that was the type of reaction I got. Fortunately, the Blessed Mother did not answer that prayer, and I'm still here to tell the tale. Mm -hmm. But at that point, I thought, I, I just, what's, what's the point of this? You do all of this work, you mm -hmm. expose what's really going on, and all they do is shout at you because you, you gored their ox. And so I started reading uh, biographies. And the biography I read of Sartre, at that time, it had just come out. He, he was completely forgotten by that point. He dominated uh, the 50s and 60s with his existentialism, completely forgotten at that point. And then suddenly the details started to come out of his life about how he would use dexedrine uh, amphetamines and write for 20 hours at a stretch. And here I thought I was stupid because I couldn't understand what he was doing. And here, it, look, it, was, it wasn't any type of philosophical principle mm -hmm that I was dealing with. I was dealing with a biographical principle. In other words, there was something outside of the text that determined the text. Mm -hmm. And that was the behavior of the writer. And at that point, I came up with, formulated a, 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 an idea, which was basically, it, it, you're confronted with a choice. Either you conform the truth to your desires, or you conform your desires to the truth. If you conform your desires to the truth, then all, all you have to talk about with that writer is the truth of what he said. If you do the opposite, well, then the biography becomes the most important part of the story. Yeah. And that was the, that in my, in my, for me personally, as a, a thinker trying to move forward, that was a big breakthrough. For sure. That was well, a big breakthrough. It's a, so that's the overarching idea of the book. Um, but it goes against what you're typically told, which is, you know, you play the ball, not the man. You, you don't want to go into someone's uh, personal life. You just want to look at their intellectual ideas. Um, to do otherwise is to participate in sort of like an ad hominem attack. Right, but, um, right. People good, said that, yes. Yeah, yeah. But you do a good job. I mean, I think it's a silly idea, um, but you do a good job of explaining why that, in fact, is not the case. But maybe you could do that now. Right. No, because if... It depends on what your life is like. Mm. If, if you're conforming your desires to the truth, then your life is in many ways irrelevant. Mm. So am I going to do a big expose of Thomas Aquinas, for example, that he was really uh, dealing drugs on the side or something? 
it's it's pretty straightforward. He is what he is. He wasn't anything else. But when you get to things that seem absolutely crazy, and lots of stuff that comes up is absolutely crazy. Let's take the Oedipus complex, for example. Yeah. Every every man desires to have sex with his mother. Or well, wait a minute. I I I, I every man. I, I I don't remember having that desire. To be honest with you, where did this come from? Mm. Well, it didn't come from reality. It came from the mind of Sigmund Freud. And I go into great detail in that part about where that actually came from. So, as I said, if you're not conforming your uh, life to the moral order, which is practical reason, uh, your your disordered life is the best explicator of your art or your philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I totally agree. And we'll, I was going to talk about Freud later, but let's talk about him now. This idea of the primal horde I'd come across before, but I didn't realize how insane it was uh, until reading this book. So tell me if I've got this right. The idea was that like, there's one sort of patriarch, he monopolizes all the women. And as a consequence, like his children, his, his male children begin to resent him because they want, they lust after their mothers. And then they go and uh, kill him and eat him. This is totem and taboo, I think. Um, and then they also internalize his um, sort of uh, incest taboo or something. And that this wasn't just like some sort of, uh, he wasn't just speculating about literature. He actually thought this was uh, an anthropological reality that could right. be seen in um, Aboriginal Australians. I thought that like I'd heard it before, but I didn't realize that he actually thought this was an anthropological fact. I didn't realize that. Right, right. So first of all, uh, Freud uh, pillaged other people's works, and he never gave them credit. Nietzsche is the classic example. Uh, Barrowell's memoirs, The History of Jacobinism. Uh, he got the Oedipus complex from Nietzsche, it's clear, mm -hmm. but he burned his notes, notebooks three times so that nobody, always trying to cover up his trail. So this uh, uh, story is basically from Vico. Mm -hmm. It's in his Nuova Sienza. I cover this in uh, uh, Logos Rising. Uh, it's, it makes sense when Vico says it, when Freud says it, it doesn't make sense because he's, Freud thinks he's got to have some type of scientific basis for what he's doing. That generation was obsessed with science. You couldn't do anything unless it was based on science. Mm -hmm. So he tried to do uh, based on anthropology, but the problem was he didn't know anything about anthropology. And the man who understood that completely was Father Wilhelm Schmidt, who was a divine word priest who had done extensive anthropological work in the uh, South Pacific, uh, Melanesia and Polynesia, to be uh, specific. Uh, and uh, uh, Schmidt wrote uh, uh, a huge tome, Germanic tome, called Der Ursprung der Gottes Idee, the source of the idea of God, in which he said basically that the more primitive the tribe, the more monotheistic it was. And that polytheism was a later development of, and it showed decadence uh, in the culture. Mm. Anyway, uh, Wilhelm Schmidt wrote a review of Freud's Totem and Taboo and ripped his book to shreds. And Freud never forgave him. He absolutely never forgave him. Mm. So th that because he exposed, th th this guy was a charlatan. He was a con man. And, and uh, the part that is not in Degenerate Modern's, which I discovered later, is uh, what was really going on. And this is in uh, Libido Dominandi, where uh, Freud was basically in competition with Jung, who was supposed to be his Gentile heir apparent, about seeing who could get the most wealthy Americans mm. to lie down on the couch. And one of them was uh, a, a doctor who came over, wanted to become a psychiatrist. His name was Horace Frank. Uh, and when he laid, he had to go through psychoanalysis with Freud. And during that psychoanalysis, he told Freud that he was having an affair with one of his wealthy patients. All patients are wealthy patients when it comes to psychiatry at this point. Yeah. So Freud, instead of saying, well, this is terrible, this violates everything we know about professional ethics. No, Freud didn't say that. He said, what you should do is divorce your wife, marry this woman, and then give me a big contribution out of that woman's fortune. This shows exactly what was going on here. It was a manipulation for crass, a form of control 
controlling individual wealthy people for uh, financial gain. That's yep. all it was. Yep. Um, I just thought we would, because we're gonna, I want to talk about Margaret Mead. Uh, you mentioned anthropology. And I was thinking, do you think that, because uh, I recently decided I wanted to read some anthropology books and I went out and I purchased um, an anthology by Margaret Mead. And I also purchased Coming of Age in Samoa, not that I read it. And then I also got a book by, I think, Ruth Benedict. Is that her teacher? Um, anyway, I I um, was thinking, do you think it's a useful field or do you think it actually is just pretty junk? No, it's, it's for real. As I said, if you want real anthropology, read Wilhelm Schmidt, mm. uh, because that's somebody who doesn't have an ax to grind. Yeah. And that's the opposite of Margaret Mead. So Margaret Mead's the classic example. She was exposed, by the way, by an Australian, mm, an Australian yeah. anthropologist. So congratulations to <laughs> Australia for doing, providing the service to humanity. But uh, basically, uh, Margaret Mead projected her own problems onto Samoa. Yeah. So she said it was a free love paradise. I call this Blue Lagoon anthropology. Mm. There's a movie called Blue Lagoon where uh, you get Brooke Shields to take off her clothes. Uh, and it's it suddenly when you show up in Samoa, human nature doesn't apply anymore. Yep. Because all of those, what, what is the point of, of Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict and Franz Boas? They were all united uh, in saying that environment controlled human behavior. And mm. in this sense, they were arguing with the race people who said that biology determines human behavior. So the biology, uh, the race, uh, the uh, environment people won out because that was, the, the government wanted that, was uh, uh, trying to get, oh, get rid of racism. Didn't like it. It was too ethnocentric. Yeah. Well, the reason so I- they, asked, These people- I was just going to say the reason- I'm saying that- the, go, no, no, you go. Sorry, Dr. Um, Dr. Jones. I, the only reason I'm saying that these people were useful for the United States government in their campaign against racism or uh, and that's why they are known as the famous anthropologists that they are the reason that i asked you about um anthropology whether you thought it was a useful field or not was that um there's a line in that first chapter where you say something like anthropology went from basically being like this very racist field and then i think with ruth benedict and margaret mead it made a shift into this sort of total um, emphasis on the environment above all else it did a pendulum swing and um i've i did a couple of units of anthropology at university and it was one of the most like you know everything's politically charged these days but this was one of the most uh politically charged politically correct uh departments you could you know go right. to so that's my, right i was like it seems like an inherently interesting thing the study of um different people, particularly when you live in like a very homogenized, globalized world, you know, you want to actually learn about genuinely different cultures, but you can't really seem to do it without just getting the, yeah, just getting preached to by again, yeah, someone like Margaret Mead, who I think you mentioned that she like was into mediums and other things. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, it, the, the state of academe today is First of all, it should be no uh, criterion for the science as itself. Mm. You can do anthropology. You for can sure. come to it with, a, with an open mind. And by an open mind, I don't mean something. You don't have your firm beliefs. Obviously, Father Schmidt and the divine word priests all believed that bringing Christianity to these people was a good idea. Yeah. Okay? But that didn't blind them to, to what was happening uh, at the time or being able to study these cultures. Point is, the other problem is you can't do it anymore mm. because there's no, there are no native cultures anymore. Yeah. Maybe if you go to the, if you go to the Amazon rainforest and try to study the Yanomamo, uh, first of all, you can't get in because the Brazilian government has decided we're going to freeze these people in time and we're not allowed going to allow them to develop. Mm. And so as a result, it's kind of like, uh, 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 it's, it's like, uh, the noble savage yep. being projected onto these poor people who are murder, are brutal, you know, brutal savages. They're not noble at all. They're, so uh, the National Geographic got down there at a certain point. And there's a guy there who's ready to eat 
the cameraman. If he, if he allowed, if he had had his way, he would have killed him and eaten him. Uh, there's another an island off the coast of India where you got another reserve of people like this. Mm. So it, 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 this is there's probably some type of hostile reaction to outsiders. They've already been contaminated by the culture. So if you go to Africa, for example, you're never going to find any people like this anymore. They don't exist. They've all made contact with civilization and civilization now is what they have to adopt. So yeah. the question is who's civilization and what civilization? That's the, that's the issue. That's the issue now. But you can't do, this was a, a, a project that existed at a certain moment in time. Mm. The end of the 19th century after uh, a Vico had had this influence on historical sciences in Germany, creating archaeology and anthropology at the same time. You could still go to places like the uh, Australia, not uh, the South Pacific, and find cultures that hadn't been touched by civilization and study them. Can't do that anymore. Can't do it. Yeah, no, you can't do it. But um, yeah, I think that it, it still is something. I was thinking about reading The Golden Bow. Do you know this book? Have you heard of this one? It's a famous. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, Fraser's that, book. Would that be worth reading or no? Anything is worth reading if you know what you're doing. Yeah, for if sure. If you have a purpose in mind. Otherwise, if you don't have a purpose in mind, you tend to get lost in their, it's like a huge catalog. How do you organize this catalog? Mm. I'm not sure Fraser was able to organize it. And it was influential on people like Jung and also on people like uh, T.S. Eliot and The Wasteland and stuff like that. Mm. But uh, to go to that without some type of definite plan in mind is is dangerous. You just yeah. might get lost. For sure. Um, so Margaret Mead, Coming of Age, one of the most popular books, but pretty much totally BS, like the, the, what she said about... Um, well, the sexual paradise or whatever, and, and what it's like to come of age just did not. And, and also you make the point that she may have not even really known the language, right? That's no. another point you made. No, she, all, all she knew was that she felt guilty about committing adultery. Mm. That's all she knew. And then she projected that onto the, the poor Samoans mm. and tried to turn it into a free love paradise uh, to prove that, all that moral law, which is written on your heart, no matter where you come from on this earth, was all just a fabrication of Christianity and the West. Mm. And so therefore, you could simply dispense with it. And here's the book that will make you feel better if you committed adultery. Mm. That's basically what Margaret Mead's book was. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll change track. We'll talk about, um, I want to talk about uh, Keynesian economics, because um, you made this great point where you, you think that... Uh, Keynesian economics can more or less be explained by the fact that he was childless and, and the sort of life that he lived, right? Um, that the, the Keynesian model of hu running huge debts is um, conducive to someone who doesn't think about posterity, basically. Yeah, in the long run, we're all dead. That's the famous, the famous uh, line uh, from Keynes. Mm. Uh, and and, and now if you want a more nuanced version of my understanding of Keynes, I have to recommend um, Barren Metal, yeah. which is my book on economics. A History of Economics is the Conflict Between Labor and Usury. And he comes off better in that book because in many ways, that, that chapter you're talking about is about Bloomsbury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not really about Keynes. Keynes was a member of Bloomsbury, but it doesn't focus on Keynes. It focuses on people like Lytton Strachey and uh, his promotion of the higher sodomy. Mm. Now, what he called the higher sodomy, uh, which uh, and, and Keynes was a homosexual mm. uh, during his uh, university days. But then he, he married a, ba a ballerina, Russian ballerina. So it just shows you that there's it's not a gene that makes you a homosexual. Mm. Uh, probably it, one of the things that uh, is conducive to this is the English boarding schools. Uh, which uh, are, are hotbeds of homosexual behavior. But the, the, the root of that is uh, relationship with the father, which is some, something that even Sigmund Freud knew. The focus of that chapter is homosexuality as a, a subversive, a, as a war against nature. And I quote uh, E.M. Forster's book, uh, Maurice. Uh, so, so to get to your point, uh, I, I think Keynes pulled himself out of homosexuality. 
Mm. So he's not typical at all of the Bloomsbury crowd uh, who, who kind of weaponized and then used it as a springboard into to, uh, spy, treachery, uh, mm. treason, which the you have with someone like Sir Anthony Blunt. The Bloomsburg, um, I have to admit that on my coffee table, I have a like a this coffee table book of the Bloomsburg house because like, well, everything you say, I, I sympathize with, but um, it was an aesthetic household. That's one thing I'll add. <laughs> if you've seen photos of it, I like the way the looks. Yeah, well, that wasn't their doing. They simply inherited that from their Victorian parents. Yeah, there you go. And so the, the uh, what did they do? Uh, well, what the, what contribution did they make to the beauty and civilization that had been bequeathed to them by their rich parents? Not much, mm. not much. They had no children. Virginia Woolf ended up committing suicide. She's probably the leader of the whole mm. damn thing. Uh, certainly, uh, yeah, I'd say she's the leader of the whole thing. Uh, and uh, she, there, she she just was a very unpleasant lady. Mm. You know, just very unpleasant. The uh, the great the the poet uh, I forget his name now. The, he's Australian. Wasn't he Australian? Roy Campbell, the Australian poet, ran into her. He 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 ran screaming from the room. He could not stand her or Lady <laughs> Adeline Morell. Uh, D. H. Lawrence couldn't stand them. They were just they were just uh, obnoxious people. Mm. Uh, uh, but they 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 did leave some literary stuff behind. Virginia Woolf wrote novels, and and uh, that's become the norm for. English literature of the 1920s, basically. Uh, I, I, I study, I, as I said, I studied literature in graduate school. And if you talk about the 1920s, you read Virginia Woolf and E.M. Forster and Lytton Strachey to some extent. Well, wait a minute, they weren't the mainstream back then. The mainstream mm. was people like H.G. Wells and G.K. Chesterton yeah. arguing with each other. Wells writing his history of civilization and then G.K. Chesterton arguing with them, writing The Everlasting Man. Uh, as his response so th it's uh, once again the the uh, uh the what was deviant then is now normal yeah yeah, yeah. and that's uh, the status of bloomsbury is exactly uh, indica indicative of that yeah the um you make a good point about because i think did virginia wolf write um the mrs delaway the Del what's yes it? Yeah. yes and it's just and that kind of book was um was was apparently like the start of well one of the first books to really implement like stream of consciousness which i just always hated as it, it's just not pleasant to read and you make this point that like that style of writing or that innovation is um sort of indicative of of this attitude that was prevalent with those people which was like the individual psyche is the only true reality this sort of solipsism right. the solipsism would be right for it. yeah yeah, that's right. That's right. And so the classic example is Ulysses, uh, which is, you know, insufferable. It's an insufferable book. Mm. Uh, but but what are we talking about? What is, what is art? Art is imitation of nature. Yeah. Okay. That's what Aristotle said. He was right. It's true to this day. I just wrote a book on that. It's my next book. And it's called The Dangers of Beauty, The Conflict Between Mimesis and... Uh, uh, concupiscence in the fine arts. Okay, so art is imitation of nature. Now, that means you have to see nature. Mm. Well, if you're talking about the mind, the mind in this regard is like a window. So the, cl the cleaner the window, the better you can see nature and the better you can produce art. So what do we have here? Uh, dirty windows, uh, dirty windows, dirty minds, and basically focusing on the dirt on the window. I, I don't want to take that too literally because mm. I'm just, I'm not trying to make a moral case here. I'm trying to make an epistemological case here. Yeah, I get what you're saying. That I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now that the dirt on your window is not as interesting as the landscape outside yeah. of your window. And, and if you're going to focus on the window pane, you're going to end up with boring novels. And that's what happened. It just went, it, it, it was a fad that ended very quickly. Yeah. And quickly. I mean, so you have what, what, uh, changes, uh, multiple, uh, experiments in point of view. That was good. That wasn't bad. Ford Maddox Ford did it. Uh, Faulkner did it in sound and fury. And, J uh, as you said, uh, um, uh, Virginia Woolf did it in Mrs. Dalloway. That's not a bad idea. And, and that did continue. So if you take someone like uh, 
uh, Follett. What's the guy's first name? Ken Follett, who did a book called uh, The Eye of the Needle about World War II. He's kind of, he writes kind of thrillers. That's not a bad book. That's a really good book in terms of keeping your interest and plot. But the point, what you realize is when you're really involved in a good book, you forget everything. Yeah. You just forget everything. I mean, the, 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 the roast is burning in the oven <laughs> and you just want to find out what's going to happen here. Yeah. You know, and that's the type, that's the type of uh, book that Ken Follett could write or did write with uh, the eye of the needle. That's exactly what I'm talking about here when I'm talking about mimesis. It's imitation yeah. of an action. Now, the problem with Follett is that he's kind of superficial and it, it, the technique wears off after a while. And he wrote just bad books after that. But he was, if you could add some type of meaning <clears throat> to that, you could really have a great work of art. Yeah, this uh, is something that Chesterton said, what you're saying about the window and the landscape is that Chesterton... I can't remember. It was that book about um, the anarchist or whatever. It's a short book. It was a great one. I've forgotten it. But he, at the start, he went and said something to the effect of, um, in the past, you would take a totally um, average person and put them, to a totally ordinary per person and put them in extraordinary circumstances. So they'd go on this huge adventure. And at the end of it, they're completely changed and they're no longer ordinary, right? And then he's like, now what you do is you take an extraordinary quote unquote person and you put them in totally ordinary circumstances and everything is about what they're thinking. You know what I mean? And he said, yeah. oh, he said, I'm not going to, I'm going to go against the grain or the growing trend. And I'm going to write about an ordinary person who's in an extraordinary circumstance. And that style of writing is so much more interesting and it just is so much more enjoyable and you can see that even with something like, even though it's a kind of trash, but like even Harry Potter, you know, this speaks to people much more like that's a very popular movie and book. Um, and it's, a, it's exactly that where it's kind of like a ordinary person in an extraordinary circumstance. I think it speaks to us much more than this sort of solipsism that was promoted by the Bloomsburg group. And um, like you said, Joyce with Ulysses. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It, it wore very thin. And ultimately, I, I, I'm not really interested in, in your mind mm. that much. If this, if this is it, I'm not really interested. And I think there's a moral dimension to this, too, uh, because um, Aquinas said that lust darkens the mind, uh, which means you can't perceive things that you should perceive. So the, the lion is so fixated on capturing the prey that he can run into a trap. Mm. And that's so the problem here with this stream of consciousness, why, why are you so focused on your consciousness? Mm, true. Uh, 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 but what you're saying is basically the window has gone dark. Mm. I can't see out the window anymore. The lust is, and lust was a big part of what was going on here. It's obvious, 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 obvious that the hidden grammar of Bloomsbury was the higher Sodom. Yep. And that they were all in rebellion against what they perceived of as Victorian morality. And yeah. that that was the end of literature. There was a literature had a great run in England from the, they, they coincided with the Methodist revival. And I'm saying you, you, you have to have a certain level of moral discipline before you can appreciate poetry because mm. it's a refined, uh, it's a you need a refined taste to do that. That's not something that it's not something that crude people can do, mm, you know. Yeah. And you had this refined reading. First of all, you had a lot of people who could read in England. You had a publishing industry that was producing books of sermons and then books of poetry. And you had a highly sophisticated, highly educated public that was simply handed to this generation on a platter and they pissed it away. Mm. That was, that's the legacy of, of Bloomsbury. No offspring, you know, no offspring. Can because we they were engaged in the higher sodomy. Can we talk about the, um, it's a bit of a digression. It's not so much about the uh, book, but um, this, you're saying that Bloomsburg at the time was sort of on the fringe or was the avant-garde whilst the actual popular literature was H.G. Wells and G.K. Chesterton. And um, I, what you said about, um, I know that a lot of their literature <laughs> is responding they're responding to each other in their literature. So like, um, I, I can't remember, but GK Chesterton would write things very much inspired 
um, very much in response to the, what he saw as the scientism of H.G. Wells. Right. Could you talk, right. talk a little bit about that? And was this popular? Like, was this in, um, were, were Chested and, and Wells read by like um, the great mass of people? Yes, much more so than Lytton Strachey or uh, mm. uh, <laughs> Virginia Woolf. Yes, they had much bigger audiences then mm. uh, at that time. So, so the, the the main issue at this point was was science. You're right. Mm. It was science, and it was at that point it had degenerated into science versus religion. Mm. So there was this this whole development over the course of the 19th century. The whole the great moment in. Uh, the 19th century came with German idealism, uh, a big, significant philosophical movement that began with Kant and basically resurrected reason after mm. the English had destroyed it. I, I now I know David Hume is technically from Scotland, okay, so it's British culture, it's not the English, but he had destroyed reason. Mm. It was called skepticism. The mind was completely worthless, basically a mirror of reality, if that, and that was it. And the Germans resurrected that. And then Coleridge and Wordsworth went to Germany and they Coleridge brought it back. Wordsworth didn't, but Coleridge did. And he created basically a whole renaissance uh, of English letters in, in, in England. All they carried through the 19th century, all the way up to T.S. Eliot uh, and the foundation of literary criticism in the 20th century, which was important. And I ended, I ended up on the tail end of that when I went to graduate school, and now it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. What, uh, it's been destroyed. You were in the university probably, I, I know you were there much more recently than I was, and I don't know whether you took a literature course, but mm. if you did, you, you wouldn't have taken the same type of course that I was taking or teaching. I took a, the, it was just totally a trash, because w w I think that people have said this before, it's not an original insight, but that the literature department is um, you really at the forefront of like political correctness or whatever you want to say. And it's almost like totally against reading now in that like, um, I remember being told, right? Like, you know, the, the, uh, that typical stuff about the canon, right? Like you don't want to read the great texts. It's just like pompous at best and like dangerous at worst. So what you end up reading is like books written, like, honestly, I was reading books written, you know, in the past five to 10 years. And um. Yeah, I did have some professors who were actually pretty decent and they made you read, for instance, um, Paradise Lost. Um, that was an interesting experience. But otherwise, generally speaking, it was a totally... Um, and, and, that, and that typical red pen approach, I think Paglia talks about how like you go through the, the classics and you know you have the red pen or racism, sexism, whatever. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That's, that's what it was like. So um, I did do a, I did study um, some literature, but uh, I quickly decided to drop that because it was just a waste of time. Yeah. Yes, you're. That's typical of your generation. A mm. Typical situation in America is you go to the university and the first course you have is composition being taught by a feminist, mm. and that destroys any appreciation of literature that you will ever have, and you never mm. want to go near a literature course after that, because what is literature? In this regard, it's projecting your prejudices onto the past. Mm. Well, why do I need to do that? I don't need to learn to do that. That's the default setting of human nature. The mm. whole the, there was something important that was yeah. being missed here. The first part, there's literature is very important from a pedagogical point of view. Mm. Because when you're talking about young people, let's say someone who's 18, 19, 20 years old they haven't developed the ability to think abstractly. Mm. And so for the most part, philosophy, they can't comprehend philosophy, mm. but they can comprehend literature. And they know that there's a story, you can get involved in a narrative, even if you can't think philosophically. And then if you're really good at analyzing the narrative, you can come up with some type of philosophical categories. So, I mean, that's I, so I read Nathaniel Hawthorne and I noticed there's an angel image that pops up and then there's a machine image that pops up and they pop up throughout his literature. And I suddenly realized, well, there's probably a reason for this because he lived right at the time of the conflict between idealism and mechanism. Mm. This is, as I said, Hegel died in 1830. And after that you had materialism. 
which is another form of mechanism. Mm -hmm. And so if people who are growing up at that particular coming of age, as Hawthorne was at that particular time, understood the conflict and tried to resolve it, and, and Hawthorne failed. Uh, uh, but he wrote a lot of books doing that. So all I'm saying is what I... I was in that situation where I, 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 I was trying to develop my ability for abstract thinking, but the best way to develop it was by reading literature yeah. because it was an easy way in to bigger issues, uh, which are always philosophical issues. That's so, that's such a great point that you made about like, uh, the study of literature almost being a precursor to like the study of philosophy. Isn't this thing, there's this thing called like hermeneutics or something. It's, um, putting yourself in the mind of uh, someone from a different historical era. And I think that that is so valuable, actually having to stop, as opposed to just applying your prejudices to the past. Actually right. stopping, like you said, which is what they do now. And what is, that's just human nature. The study of literature, if it's going to be serious, you need to stop, put aside your own prejudices and actually attempt to... Um, think like this person and inhabit their right. world. Ab yeah. Absolutely. That is the whole point of it, to put aside your temporal prejudices and try and figure out what this guy was saying 100 years ago or 200 years ago. It's mm. like, uh, do you know? Uh, so you never studied Kipling. I guarantee that. You never read Kipling's oh. poetry. There's a, a particularly apropos right now, when you're wounded and left on Afghanistan's plains, <laughs> and the women come out to cut up what remains, just roll to your rifle and blow out your brains and go to your God like a soldier. Well, now, wait a minute. That, that sounds awful. You know what I mean? It's relevant because he, he understood Afghanistan in that regard. Uh, but it's, it's kind of pleasurable to read it because yeah. it all fits together. It rhymes, the meter's right. And so, I, like, I remember as a child reading Gunga Dean, you know? You may talk a gin and beer when you're quartered safe out here and sent to penny fights and Alda shot it. But when it comes to slaughter, you will do your work on water and lick the blooming boots of him that's got it. Now in Inja's sunny clime, where I used to spend me time, a servant of her majesty, the queen, the finest man I knew in all that blackface crew, was our regimental bisti, Ganga Dean. Now there's something pleasurable about that. I, I, I just enjoy saying it, but when you get, I can imagine the, the, the politically correct English professor just immediately exploding <laughs> when you read something like Ganga Dean. Yeah. My, favorite line, my favorite line in this regard in that poem is, you know, he's trying to tell you what a great guy Ganga Dean was, you're a better man than I, Gunga Dean. And then he says, and for all his dirty eyed, he was white, clear white inside. <laughs> I, I just, now that is such a great line. Mm. <laughs> you can see all of the people blowing a fuse, but the whole point of this is to try and put aside your prejudices and try and think, uh, well, okay, this is British imperialism. Mm, I'm not yeah, a of fan of British imperialism, but there's something enjoyable about simply the way he put these words together. And mm. we can talk, we should be able to talk about the, the conflicting feelings we have, but that's just lost now. You don't have any sense of what uh, uh, of poetry as something that is pleasurable in and of itself. Yeah, of course. And, and I think that it's terrible because at the moment there is this great yearning um, for not for, for for a sense of for a sense of identity i think first and foremost which art has always given people um and culture has always given people but then also i think that there is this there's this great almost like oppressive um homogenous culture and you you want to escape it but you can't escape it in space you know you can get on a plane and go to the other side of the world but you'll be in a in a city that looks almost exactly the same as the one you live in so right. the only real escape is in, is in literature and history. And that one little outlet, that one little escape and that one alternative um, vision that could have been given to young people isn't because everything needs to adhere to, you know, um, the standard right. of today. And, and like, just on a spiritual level, that's really damning because 
no no one's able to ever yeah like you said no one's able to experience true difference true diversity you know what i mean yeah yeah true diversity or transcend the prejudices of your own culture Mm. and we certainly have a lot of prejudices most of what our culture is is prejudice right now. exactly so that that's why literature is important it's a shame that it was wrecked i was there i had a front row seat as it was being wrecked because i was in graduate school in the 1970s Stanley Fish was uh, my teacher. Stanley Fish was a Jew. Uh, He hated new criticism, which is what I was raised in. New criticism was a kind of uh, Protestant literary criticism because it was a form of sola scriptura. In other words, every man had the right to interpret his own poem. You just had to have a close reading and you Mm. had to be able to back up your claims by citing passages in the text, okay? So it was what it, it was Christian. You're right. It was Protestant, and mm. and uh, these people knew that and they hated it. So Stanley Fish, uh, along with another Jew by the name of uh, Jacques Derrida, who was the father of deconstruction, basically launched a jihad against literary criticism, uh, new criticism, and they succeeded, mm. and they destroyed it. And what they put in this place was Talmudic as opposed to Sola Scriptura. And Talmudic criticism means basically you never cite the text. The Torah is the text. You never cite the text. It's always, you're always reading some rabbi. Mm. So just as every man was his own literary critic, his own uh, priest with new criticism, now you have to listen to the rabbi and you're not allowed to talk about the text anymore. You're only allowed to cite the rabbi and Mm. his Talmudic utterances. That's what happened. Yeah, it's a, it is a real shame. Perhaps we'll um, change track. We can talk about Picasso. So I actually visited an uh, exhibition. When I was in Barcelona, I, went, I visited a Picasso gallery. And I sort of hadn't really studied him before or even really looked at much of his work. But I noticed a clear trend, which is it starts with this sort of mimesis, right, that you mentioned before, where right. he's trying to accurately represent nature and reality. And it slowly um, evolves or rather devolves um, over time into literal like um, childish scribblings. And I thought that was a linear process until I read Degenerate Moderns. It's not linear. In fact, within that process, he did uh, return to, uh, to Mimesis. And you make a very interesting case for um, why and when he um, returns to Mimesis. Yeah, every time he fell in love with a woman, he would do uh, uh, an an accurate mimetic representation of her face Mm. because he was in love with her. And then when when sexual disgust set in and he got tired of her, that's when he that's when he did the uh, the Cubist portraits. Mm. So the the class you can take any number of of his uh, conquests, his sexual conquests. Therese uh, Walter, the the. The the uh, teenager, he met her. She was seventeen when they started their affair. Uh, she starts off looking beautiful, and he end, she ends up looking like a beach ball, for mm. some reason because he saw associated her with sports. Dora Mar is the opposite. She was dark. Uh, Therese was blonde, and she starts off looking good. Uh, you know, realistic poets. And then when he gets tired of her, you have a uh, weeping woman, which mm. is the cubist uh, distortion of her. So it's. Cubism in this regard is a function of his sexual uh, mood at the time. If it, when he's infatuated, it's realistic. When he gets disgusted with her, it becomes cubist. Now, that's uh, what I said in Degenerate Modern. I think it's true. Mm. And it's borne out by l- looking through the Zervos catalog, which is all of his works together. You can track the state of the relationship by mimesis or the absence of mimesis. Mm. Do you think that cubism, like stream of co- like stream of consciousness, is a form of like solipsism? Like it's a this um, obsession with the self um, and one's own perception over and above reality. Yes. Okay. Now I'll give you my state of the art understanding of Picasso now, mm. because I just did. I just I, as I said, I just finished a book on art, and I dealt with Picasso again. So. When you, when you move away from mimesis, okay, you're moving away from reality. And the farther you move away, the less important the artist becomes. Mm. And so what you saw over the 20th century was a, a, a movement away from mimesis. It began in France with Impressionism. Mm. 
mm. because that coincided with the invention of the camera. The invention of the camera had a devastating effect on mimesis because the, the artist felt, well, a machine can do that. Why do I have to worry about that anymore? Well, a machine cannot do mimesis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a mechanical reproduction that is not mimesis. Only the human mind can do mimesis. Sure. So basically it's, it, it moved away. And then you had a kind of formalism uh, with someone like Cezanne, who mm. tried the the, the grand, grand grand banlieue, the the bathers? You know, you can see that kind of yeah. pyramidal uh, structure. You can see the geometry in Cezanne, and then Picasso comes along and he does his caricature of Le Grand Banlieue, and it's called Les Dames of d'Avignon, which is the first modern painting. And d'Avignon is the Carré d'Avignon, which is a the red light district in Barcelona, and we got whores looking at us. Mm. exhibit exhibitionistic whores looking at us and this is the uh his uh attempt to uh control what had gone on before him to, in channels that he found congenial now if if that's fine nobody paid any attention to him until a german jew by the name of Kahnweiler showed up in paris in 1907 which is the same year uh, picasso did the damsel d'avignon and he was the dealer. He was an art dealer. And was, so when you move away from mimesis, the art dealer becomes the most important guy, not the painter, the art dealer. Yeah. And so when Kahnweiler arrived, he said, I have an idea. We'll create a movement. We'll call it cubism. That mm. was his idea. And he got Picasso and Brock together, created a movement, caught, caused a big stir. Everybody took uh, notice and he made a lot of money. That is the story of the 20th century. Okay, so it went from there, even farther from Mimesis, uh, New York, 1947, you have abstract expressionism. Again, mm. uh, you, I can name the artist, you could say it's Jackson Pollock, you know, uh, but if you can't tell whether the picture's hanging right side up or upside down, uh, the dealer is the most important guy. And the dealer, another Jew shows up, and this guy is Leo Castelli, uh, and he shows up and he starts promoting. He gets in on the tail end of abstract expressionism. But his great achievement is pop art. Yeah. Well, pop art is in many ways the exact opposite of abstract expressionism. It's not mimesis. It's products, mm. Brillo boxes, soup cans, this type of thing, a reaction to abstract expressionism that misses the point every bit as much as abstract expressionism did. These people would basically come, if you were a wealthy uh, stockbroker in New York City, you could go to this, you heard about it in the New York Times, you go down to the gallery and the guy could tell you basically, if you buy this, it's an investment, it will increase in value by X amount. And it was true. It's like stock. Yeah. The more people who buy the stock, the more the price goes up. And that's precisely so art became a form of insider trading. And so, therefore, there's no point in talking about it in terms of aesthetic categories. Yeah. That's not what's going on here. Yeah, dude, Thomas Wolfe was the guy who um, blew lid on this, right? The, the, one of the first right. people to, to realize that nowadays, uh, basically, it is just a way of like avoiding tax and other things. Uh, you said, I got the impression in Degenerate Moderns that you were actually somewhat sympathetic towards uh, impressionism, because in a way, it, it, it is still a form of mimesis. Uh, is that correct or misinterpretation? Yeah, there is there is an attempt. I mean, if you're talking about the light at twilight, for example, mm. that's that's mimesis, you yeah. know. And and obviously, it has a distorting effect on the building that's behind it or something like that. So it is a form of mimesis, but it's moving away. Mm, I think yeah. from from what had been achieved before, because what had been achieved before had just become too stylized. Mm. That that was the problem with the uh, salon, the annual salon that they had. Uh, it had become too stylized, a and um, uh, and you you could learn how to do that. And to the extent that it became stylized, it was not mimesis anymore. It was an old form of mimesis. Mm. And you can't, reality is never being going to be able to be captured by any artistic mind. And so what you had here was an attempt to come to a new form of mimesis, which is fine. That's true. Mm. But you're, you're always dealing with the, the parameters, the same parameters here. So 
it's got to be so it's the parameters are existence and essence okay and essence could be triangles but if you focus just on essence and just on geometry you end up like something like mondrian mm. which is which is boring and it's not art it's design it's not art on the other hand you can go in the other direction so you know you can look out your window and it's kind of a frame and it's reality out there but it's not organized at all or maybe it is but you can look at i don't know what's outside your window maybe it's a garden so maybe it is organized you know what i mean or maybe it's a parking lot that's certainly organized but it's ugly you know so what what you have to have is the perfect blend of existence and essence and that's precisely what you did not get in the 20th century yeah so you had in one sense you had abstract expressionism followed by hyper realism which was basically photographic image now not all of it but a lot of it was simply photographic images well ph photography is not mimesis yeah 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 it's 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 a mechanical parody of mimesis that's only such the a human good point. mind can organize that's such a good point because um you see uh some people call them uh, online they call them vulgar trads and they're basically just reactionaries they look at like modern art they're like uh, it's terrible and i sympathize with them for saying that but then what they do is they um go and embrace a form of photorealism or something like that and they don't realize that that is just the pale imitation of um of mimesis it's or, or not even a pale imitation it's not mimesis like you said um yeah they're very very interesting points um i think now if you don't mind there's i, I want to get to the, the last two chapters which are on freud and jung and luther so we'll change track quickly um we've talked a little bit about Freud, but I, I want to speak to you about Jung. It seems to me that he's gone through a bit of a revival. I'm sure that he's always been popular, but um, Jordan Peterson was obviously a Jungian and uh, has promoted and popularized Jung. He's, he's like a, almost like a household name now. Um, Jung, the sort of Jungian religion, right? Where, you know, there's no one God. It's not monotheistic. It's like, there's, there's truth to all religions. I think that that has been useful in a way um, because prior to that, I feel like the, the sort of status quo was the four horsemen of the apocalypse, that style of atheism. And I think that Peterson by popularizing Jung sort of brought a lot of people away from that sort of vulgar atheism, but it's been replaced by this new form of religion, which is basically yeah. just psychology. I was wondering what your opinion on that is, if you think it's a good thing or a bad thing on balance yeah so which which should we choose here i'll give you two choices atheism or the occult mm -hmm. <laughs> which is which which are you going to choose yeah that's your two choices exactly <laughs> that's so that's freud or jung because mm. jung was heavily involved in the occult his his uh, mother carried on seances uh it's the occult the tradition at the time of the anthropological golden age <clears throat> And that's what that's what uh, that's what Jung is. Mm. Uh, that's what he became after he broke with Freud. He ended up with this type of talking about archetypes. It just seems to me it's kind of historically dated. Uh, uh, I, it, it came out of the anthropological revival, the Golden Bough, all that type of stuff, where you discovered all of these religions and all of the myths that they had there, and they're. Yeah, there probably was some truth to a lot of these myths. That's true, mm. okay? But that's not a substitute for religion. And I think that's what he tried to make it. And I think the people who were unhappy with uh, religions that told you not to have sex with your neighbor's wife uh, found some type of solace in this Jungian uh, confection of myths. Mm. So you, would you say that the attraction, the modern attraction towards Jung um is like the desire for religion without any of the sort of discipline that a religion entails like they, they want yes. they, they want spirit it's it's typical they want spiritual yes. spirituality without actually having to subject themselves to the the moral law absolutely that's exactly what it is mm. spirituality without morals so it's like that's Gnosticism, exactly right? what it is don't you well, say it's also like it's also like buddhism yeah. you know, so if you go to buddha like jack kerouac Mm, yeah. The Catholic, the Catholic boy who wrote novels, the beatnik. Okay. He became a Buddhist because he couldn't keep his pants up. 
You know, that was that's that was Buddhism at that point. So beatnik Buddhism, if you want to call mm. it that. That's what was going on. The aura of spirituality without any of the moral discipline that goes along with it. Mm. Yeah. And then for whatever reason, that always seems to take on that uh, that occult thing. It's interesting reading about Jung and, and even just reading about the occult, because you notice the same thing with Margaret Mead is that there was an interest in mediums and things like that. And right. I spoke to my friend Gio about, um, well, there's like the perennial school of philosophy. It has this idea like called like the counter initiation. And basically what it is, is like, um, you'd be acquainted with this, but like you take uh, religious, a religious ritual or religious iconography, you pervert it, appropriate it. And all these people actually seem to have participated in that in one way or another, which is interesting. Like another thing is like both Freud and Jung's interest in Faust, you know, there's definitely something occult in the case of Jung, it's obvious, but even with Freud being an atheist, there was still something almost um, occultish or Gnostic. I'm not sure what the right word is. Yeah, atheism creates a dreary imp a universe that's impossible to live in. Mm. And then your your desire for spirituality uh, then gets sidetracked into the occult, which is uh, every bit as bad as atheism, but in an opposite way, in the opposite way. So the, the Jordan has Jordan Peterson ever talked about the Aryan Christ, the book about Jung and his involvement with National Socialism? Um, I... I don't think so, but I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah, I'm not sure either, because this is, it seems to me we're dealing with a sanitized Jung that uh, is a construct of the mind rather than the, uh, the actual reality of, of the situation. Uh, I, it, that book, when it came out, just wrecked Jung's reputation. So apparently they're suppressing it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I knew that he was, that he was like consciously Aryan because um of probably his relationship with freud and psychoanalysis more broadly which he saw as a semitic tradition which it certainly was right um and, certainly yeah Sorry, certainly God. after the break after the break this became exaggerated so mm -hmm. freud became more jewish after the break with jung and jung became more aryan after the break with freud and what there's some sort of relationship with Nazi Nazi Germany is there or yeah of course there is so this was a revival of paganism mm -hmm. so you had the Thule society this was all yeah, in yeah, the yeah. air at that point mm -hmm. this is why we do historical research because we don't know that and it's it's not doesn't exist anymore but it certainly existed then Hitler was a product of this kind of pagan revival yeah uh, the pagan occult revival that took place around that time yeah, I got that much because I know there's people like um, Savitri Devi, the Hindu, who was also a neo-Nazi. And then there's um, obviously like there's the Lebensreform movement, which is linked to um, Nazism. But I was more thinking yeah. about you're, you're saying that Jung's interest in those sort of movements, the paganism, so on and so forth, um, is Nazi or is reminiscent of Nazism by virtue of the, being interested in similar things is that what you're saying or no no it... i'm not i'm saying that they both hitler and jung came out of the same environment and yeah, were both uh involved in this type of return to paganism and the occult okay. you know a guy who did it guillermo del toro uh wrote did a movie called hellboy and one of the, one of the i think it's the first hellboy but it's really dramatic beginnings in the movie where they there are these Nazi scientists performing these occult experiments on some island off the coast of Scotland. Mm. And it's just got this weird mixture of science and pagan ritual. Uh, and uh, the American soldiers show up and then suddenly a priest pops out of nowhere and he holds up a rosary and tries to give it to the GI saying, you'll need this. And the guy just pushes them aside. It's like classic Guillermo <laughs> del Toro who doesn't do these movies. No more rosary beads in his movies. Uh, after he did uh, that ridiculous movie, uh, the shape, the shape of water, mm. which was a, a really politically correct movie. Mm. Yeah, super interesting. Um, I think I want to talk to you about Luther. Now, I don't know. There's what you wrote about Luther was very interesting. Um, I was wondering th those accounts that you draw on because because basically in the chapter you say this man was. Uh, potentially an alcoholic. It's an anachronistic term. Obviously, back then they wouldn't have used that word, but there's uh, evidence that he drank a lot. 
Um, and also that he was a bit of a womanizer. Now, when you're dealing with those primary texts, I was wondering, um, I imagine you have to be pretty careful because a lot of what, what, it, what is written about him would have been subject to, um, well, written by Catholics who were potentially like trying to disgrace him. But um, you quote one of his letters, his actual letters itself. And it seems like, yeah, he was potentially like an actual womanizer and the rest of it. Yeah, womanizer is a word like alcoholic. They didn't use that word back then. True. Okay, but but uh, Luther had problems controlling his passions. He mm. was never successful in controlling his passions, whether it was anger, whether it was lust, or whether it was uh, gluttony. He just couldn't do it. He just mm. couldn't. He was constantly getting drunk, and the more drunk he got, the more uh, he started to have lustful thoughts. And he was involved in basically going to convents and dragging the women out and then offering them up to the highest bidder, mm. uh, which is the guy who does that is known as a pimp. And mm -hmm. the letter that he wrote to the uh, uh, Bishop of Mainz is clear indication that that's what he was doing. So are you ask, if you're asking me, uh, can a Catholic uh, be honest about Luther? Uh, the question is better, can a Lutheran be honest about Luther? <laughs> because you're you're exposing things that the documentation in Hartmann Grizar's book and Denifle's book is impeccable, it's bulletproof. Yeah. And the Lutherans, they they simply they've just ignored it. They, yeah. they, they're not going to answer these questions. They've ignored it. And so uh, when you when you finally come down to Lutheran uh, trying to deal with my book, for example, he says, oh, that was that was an old book. Well, I don't care whether it's old or not. Is it true or is it not true? Yeah. Because the documentation is impeccable. And, and that's what Luther was. Yeah, well, actually, he was. So, some of the, so some of the people who, who would say, for instance, um, he's a womanizer, he's an alcoholic, um, they themselves had converted to Lutheranism. And then after seeing his behavior um, and hearing about it, they decide to convert back to Catholicism, right? Like, right. Because right. They, just, they think he's like a scoundrel. And yeah, and the main impediment, and Luther knew this, the main impediment to converting back to Catholicism was the fact that you were now married. Mm, yeah. And I deal with that in that in the in the book. And he broke because his vow. Because basically, yeah, you broke your vow. Now you're in an impossible situation because the one priest said it. He said, Look, I really would like to go back to the church, but then I see my wife and children and I'm drawn in the opposite direction. Luther mm. knew that. He yeah. knew that. And that's why he wanted to get the Archb Archbishop or the Bishop of Mainz involved in sexual behavior because it could be a form of control. Yeah. And that was the seed which led to my book, Libido Dominandi. Uh, Libido Dominandi. Yeah, of course. Well, I was literally about to uh, say um, that seems like a classic example of uh, liberation as a form of control. Um, so there's this guy called Curtis Yarvin. I don't know if you've heard of him before, but he has this idea that's interesting. I don't know if I adhere to it. But um, if you look at the current regime and our Western elites, whatever you want to call them, um, he says, a lot of people will say, you know, they're these sort of relativistic, nihilistic people. But he says, no, they're not relativistic and nihilistic. You know, in some ways they are, but in other ways, they're almost religious, right? And he says, you can interpret them almost as a heretical Protestant sect that grew out of Unitarianism. Um, I don't know if you're acquainted with this idea, but... Um, how do you think, what do you think about it just upon first hearing it all? What do you think about it? Do you think well, it sounds ridiculous or? Well, you, you kind of threw, I, I don't know how to talk about a heretical Protestant sect that came out of Unitarian. Unitarianism is no longer Protestant. It's no longer Christian. Yeah, true. So it's a late development in America after the collapse of Calvinism, basically. Mm. It, it, so that's where Unitarianism fits in. Um, Protestantism was never, in a sense, never about religion. Mm. It was about the weaponization of religion. It was uh, the only reason Luther uh, was able to do the damage he did was because he was protected by the German princes. Mm. And the German princes protected him because once the state became Luther Lutheran, the prince got all of the church property. Mm. That's what that's the driving force behind the Reformation. Yeah, it was a looting operation. You know, um, it was a looting operation in, in England. The 
my grandparents, they live in England and they live not far from Fountains Abbey, which um, is such a beautiful place, even though Cromwell ripped all the roofs off. Even when you go there now, you can realize that this was a really beautiful monastery. And um, yeah, it's, um, it, yeah, but that was definitely an example of a looting operation, what happened in um, there, England. There was no, there was no theological justification for the Reformation in England whatsoever. None. It was all looting, pure and simple. The aristocracy felt, lusted after church property. Mm. And the guy who told that story eloquently is uh, William Cobbett, his mm. history of the Reformation and the damage that it did to England. England never recovered from the Reformation. Yeah. So uh, going back, I didn't phrase the question I asked before very well. Is, is the modern world basically the world that we inhabit today, a consequence of the Protestant Reformation, right? Like, is it intimately linked with that Reformation? Or is what we're living in now completely different, totally distinct from Protestantism altogether? Like, is this the inevitable outcome of the Protestant Reformation? If, the, if does that make sense? I don't know if it's a bad Yeah. Question. Yeah, well, I could, I mean, you could talk about England. I, look, I'll give you a, a recent example. Okay, Frody Mityord, uh is has this thing called the Scansa Forum. I just debated da Jared Taylor, a white guy, who oh. uh, thinks that race race is reality, you know? And I said, no, it's a category of the mind. Frody Mityord was baptized, he's a, a Norwegian who was baptized as a Lutheran. And over the course of his lifetime, the Lutheran church simply evaporated. Mm. The, the Protestant churches have evaporated over yeah. the course of the early 21st century. They, they don't, it doesn't exist as the state church in Norway, certainly, or in Scandinavia. In England, it's a kind of shell. It never meant much. Uh, and so as a result, you have an identity crisis. And that's why Frodi, who grew up in Norway, there are no black people in Norway. I'm, I'm sure there are, but I mean, it's not a significant thing, not like the United States, where you had this huge slave trade and so on and so forth. And so, it, but when, when the Protestant church evaporated, which it had to do, it had a 500 year run, and then it just ran out of gas. Mm. And when it evaporated, it created a vacuum. And the vacuum uh, has been filled by white racism. Mm. That, it's that simple. And that's what the debate was about. But I mean, this 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 uh, disintegration took place over a 500 year period. And so if any place along the line, it's going to have different manifestations mm. than it had at the at the end uh, when it completely evaporated. Yeah. And so you have to deal with it historically. I think that that, that point that you make about like our identity being rooted in ethnicity rather than race so being rooted in language and then also in um religion it, it, that you know ethnicity is real but maybe race is not and um that when when your religion begins to totally d die then yeah you you are left with an identity crisis and i think that you make a good point when if you make being white the center of your identity well <laughs> you're going to be it's not really going to get you very far because Ever, everyone will just ignore you. Well, not just ignore you, they'll um, hound you down. So yeah, it's an interesting point. And I think people don't really treat you very fairly on that point because they think that effectively what you're saying is that um, oh, ethnicity doesn't matter at all. Or, or when, when it's- no, it, no, I, Yeah, but you don't I'm think that. I, I, no, I'm, I'm saying, I'm not going to deny the color of your hair or the shape of your nose or anything like that. Yeah, but I'm going to ask you: How does the color of your hair and the shape of your nose determine your behavior? Yeah, exactly. How does that determine your behavior? I'm not yeah. denying biological reality. I'm saying exactly. that the, uh, the, I'm dealing with a group of people. You could see at the end of that debate that neither Frody nor Jared uh, understood that there was a difference between the brain and the mind. Mm. Uh, this is materialism. This is the type of people that you're dealing with. Mm. not there's no they don't have the philosophical sophistication to deal with this and there are lots of people who are just like them and so they pander to that crowd and get a little bit of a following mm. yeah 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 totally and i think that people because i've seen the way that people i didn't actually see the debate and i'm 100 going to go and watch that now it sounds interesting um but 
I've heard you make this case before. And then I've seen like comment sections where people basically accuse you of supporting like mass migration when they clearly haven't looked into your book, uh, Slaughter of Cities, where you make a case that this is, um, you know, the ma mass migration is basically a, a form of social engineering among other things, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a victim of mass migration. Yeah. I was driven out of an Irish neighborhood. I had an I identity. I'm half Irish, so, uh, but I lived in an Irish neighborhood in Philadelphia and we had a kind of identity and it was destroyed because yeah. the government got involved in racial politics because it's easy to divide people according to race because they look different, mm. you know? A hundred percent. Okay, um, just last question. So I've decided that I'm going to read Barren Metal, which is obviously going to take a long time. And I just, as I started to read it, I thought, how on earth do you find the time to write these books? Uh, I thought I'd ask you kind of what does your average day yes. look like? Well, fortunately, we have daylight savings time in Indiana. <laughs> so that means I have one hour extra every day. Yeah. And that's how I get to write these books. We have 25 hours in the day in Indiana. <laughs> that's a joke. Okay, that's a joke. And that was the way I started my talk. No, I don't. You do it one step at a time. Yeah. And after a while, if you do something for 40 years, you get fairly efficient at doing it and yeah. so I, to be honest with you i look at that book and i think i don't know how the hell i wrote that book yeah to be perfectly honest with you but it's there and i hope you enjoy it well the thing is even it sounds weird because i start a book like that and i'm like all right here we go you know because it's a it's going to take me a long time to read and then you just think how on earth does someone write this and the point is you've written so many books and they're lengthy books as well. And then you've written ebooks as well. So do you spend like how, how, like how many hours? I know this is maybe a bit of a lame question, but how many hours do you spend reading and researching a day? How many hours are you spending writing a day? I mean, I'm sure it varies, but just a general idea. I don't do any more than eight hour days. I don't stay in the office during, because by the end of the day, if you're really doing serious work, you're too tired to continue. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So I don't do anything like more than an eight hour day. And at, at the beginning of the project, most of what I'm doing is reading. Yeah. And not writing. The writing comes at the end of the project after you cut all of these ideas in your mind, put it together. So uh, if you do the right reading and take the right notes properly and organize it, uh, it book the book sort of writes itself. Yeah, but sure. you know you, you have to build the mind up to a certain point where you can understand the connections and that takes you know you have to start off with smaller more less ambitious topics like degenerate moderns is like the beginning you yeah, know yeah, where yeah. i'm just trying to trying to figure out how can i deal with uh the intellectual life in relationship to the person the personal life how can mm. i deal with that that was the beginning of this yeah, I think that this um, Baron Metal book, I, I will let you go now because it's been a while, but the, the Baron Metal book I am looking forward to because some people have said, and I sympathize with this argument already, that sort of usury is at the heart of the problems that we face. And I, I'm convinced that that could be the case. And reading Baron Metal, I'm sure that I'll learn a lot about it. So yes, one, yes. once again, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. E. Michael Jones. This has been a really great conversation. I've really enjoyed it and I've learned a lot. Um, and hopefully in the, in the future, we could talk about Baron Metal. That would be great. Good, good. Thank uh -huh. you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Oh, well, you too.